story about uh, uh, the young the young pastor who was out in the country, uh, and uh, this stormy Sunday, the only guy that shows up is this one cow farmer. And the young pastor says, well, you know, I really appreciate you coming out, but, you know, you're the only one here, you want to cancel church? And he said, son, when I go out to feed the cows, he said, if only one comes, I still feed them. And so, okay, so the pastor got and he preached, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached, and he was preaching. And when he got done, he said, well, how'd you like that? And he said, son, when only one cow comes, I don't give him the whole load. I knew that was coming. So I'm going to try not to give you the whole load tonight, okay? Because uh, we, we, had, we had more people here from camp, but uh, folks have things to do and uh, places to go, and I guess, and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to uh, make some changes and do some things uh, on the fly here uh, a little bit tonight. So, um, so let's start with uh, In Christ Alone. Uh, we'll sing that. And something else. Let's start in Christ alone.
incredible uh, talent and ability present, and uh, uh, Walter Mastro Pietto. Oh, he got, yeah, right. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Very good. You want me to play? Please speak? come. Uh, he brought his harmonica with him, and uh, a couple of songs that he wants to play for us. And so, <laughs> knock our socks off. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Yeah, go, go ahead and use what you need. Yep. I'm going to just go through Here Comes the Saints. I'll go through it three times. Okay. Wait. Try to do is Rock of Ages. You all, we all know that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If he just had a saxophone player to play with it, he'd have it made. Uh, if you do a good one, we would. It's with me. So, Pastor Jim? Yes. Have, have you heard how he found Baptist Park? Uh, something, some kind of publicity thing we put out, you know, through like the Chamber of Commerce or something. He was in Presque Isle shopping. He lives about three hours away, south right. of here in the Sheep. And he came over here shopping, and he saw a flyer for Baptist Park, picked it up, and right. heard about a Labor Day retreat. And he called, found out the cost was reasonable. So here he is. Yeah. So uh, perfect. We, we are delighted to have you here. It was very well worth it, too. It was great. It was a good time. Great. Spiritual time. Good. 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 Glad you... Uh, uh, glad, glad you came. Uh, glad you all came. Uh, glad everyone else came who's not here to, uh, <laughs> to uh, hear, hear the things that we have going on tonight. And uh, um, one of the things that I wanted to do uh, tonight uh, was to um, say, you know, th this today 
is my third anniversary of being a pastor of Mapleton United Baptist Church. Oh, wow. I started at Mapleton United Baptist Church Church on September 1st, 2016, oh. and in the past three years, it has been my great privilege to serve with Ruth as my music minister. And I wanted to thank in front of the, you know, a few more people that were here, uh, because when we were talking about setting up this program and who's going to do the music, maybe Ruth would be available. Mary got right on the phone <laughs> <laughs> and twisted her arm. And, and as soon as I found out that Ruth was going to be here, for me, it was a big, okay. All I really have to worry about is my job of preaching. Because Ruth is going to do, uh, she's going to tickle the ivories and it's going to be good and, and things are going to go smooth. And I, I can count on that Sunday after Sunday and I have three years of um, experience to back that up. Thank you Ruth for what you do every week at Mapleton and Bethany and what you've done here this weekend. I, I appreciate it um, very, very much. Um, the next thing that we want to do is uh, bring up Rachel Bowyer. I've asked different people, did you share your testimony this morning, Scott? Yes, I, did. I, I didn't think to remind anybody about that, so I'm glad. Troy that wouldn't let me forget. Troy yeah. wouldn't let you forget. Good man. He did a good job, too. What's that? He did a good job. He did a good job, too, yeah. Job. Yep. I heard uh, Troy McCrump's testimony and Scott's testimony through Boys Brigade, uh, and so both of them uh, shared their testimony. Mary Trainer shared her testimony last night. Of, growing up in a Christian home and the experiences that she had with her husband Mike and his cancer and eventual death. Um, and Rachel Bollier, uh, her, her name came to my mind when I was thinking about people who um, have, have a testimony that I think could benefit people. They could see God at work in a real person's life. And so, Rachel, would you come on up and, and hear your testimony? And, it puzzled me why he wanted me to be honest with you because I've led such a perfect life my whole life. So <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, and then you met Gordy and, and then it just went downhill, downhill. he knows it. No. <laughs> so I know most of you here, um, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Bollier. Um, my parents are Mike and Betty Ireland. My sister and her husband are Melanie and Josh Duncan, who have grown up here at Baptist Park. And um, some of you may know my daughter, Samantha Bullier, who's um, a counselor here as well. So um, I grew up, in, and just so you know, I am not a public speaker. It's not one of my classes I ever even thought about taking just because I know this is not my calling. So um, you're doing great so far. Yes, yeah. thanks. Never yes. apologize. I won't. I, I have everything written down because I would either get off on a rambling mission or I would forget everything. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was born in a Christ-centered home. I was one week old when I started attending church at the Maple Baptist Church. At the time, my grandfather, Ellen Anderson, was the pastor. Um, I don't remember a time that I didn't know who God was. I can't remember the specific day I asked Jesus into my heart, but my parents have told me it was a, when I was a very young child. Um, while at home, my mother was a stay-at-home mom until we were all in school. She devoted all of her time um, just spending time with us, um, doing drives. Um, she even at one point took us out in the middle of the swamp backwards and put it in neutral and told us that we had to hike back because the engine just died. And she was just the mother who was always adventurous and, and doing things with us. But um, the one thing that was her biggest priority is always to make sure that um, Jesus was our priority. And so knowing that, um, I'm positive it was as young as an age that I could understand what it meant um, that Jesus was in my heart. Um, growing up, we all attended Sunday school and church weekly. Um, the people who attended the church, who still, a lot of them still attend the church, are my second family. I was baptized when I was seven years old by Pastor Ken here. Um, even with a Christian loving home, I grew up with what is called the middle child syndrome. Um, I, for those of you who know Melanie, um, my older sister um, is a little on the, a lot on the perfect side. Um, and <laughs> she, she, I love her dearly now. Um, <laughs> and then my younger brother Matthew actually made it a little easier for me um, to, to get through my teenage years because he took some of the spotlight away. So, But anyway, I've always been an emotional person. 
Um, I don't always show my emotions, but I always feel them. Um, and a lot of times I, I go with that, um, I, with my life and my emotions. But there's been many times um, through my younger years that I just didn't feel enough or um, that maybe I was less important than my siblings um, by no doing of my parents at all. But that, I just had that syndrome. Um, even at an elementary school age, I was looking for the approval of all my peers and all my friends. Um, at the time, my friends were my highest priority. I wanted them all to like me. I wanted to do everything I possibly could um, so to make sure that I fit in. Uh, that continued into my teenage years. I was so focused on all of my relationships, all my friendships, um, and looking back on it, that's, that's probably about the time that I really started actually growing further away from Christ. Um, and all my Christian roots, and just further and further away from God. When I was about 15 years old, I met who I thought was the love of my life. Um, when you're 15, you know that. Um, <laughs> and then when I was 17 years old, I became pregnant, and could feel the distance between me and God. And it was when I found out I was pregnant that um, I really just broke down and said, I know that this is not the life for me. Um, and I begged my parents, I, please help me make this right. I know I'm 17, but please let me get married. I want to start making the steps that I need to take from here um, to make things right as, as much as I could anyway. Um, after many discussions, um, my parents allowed me to get married at 17. Um, we got married, and he and I started attending church regularly together. Uh, he took baptism classes, and he um, was actually baptized at our church when my daughter was just two weeks old. I don't remember the circumstances, or why, or about the timing even, but we started just getting too busy uh, for church again. Um, distance became, with God, became to grow more, um, and I found out that he'd been unfaithful, he had another woman in his life. And after months of trying to work on things and um, trying to, to put our marriage back together uh, and going through some of the hardest times in my life, I made a decision to divorce him. Uh, at that point, I was 19 years old and a single mother. I lived in an apartment complex in Presque Isle, and I made friends with another girl who was around my age. She had lots of friends and invited me to parties that she went to. And although my parents didn't always support my decisions, they were always there for me. They were always praying for me. They always, um, anything I needed, they, they were there for me. They never turned their back on me um, as much as they probably should have, or not really should have, but um, wanted to. Um, they babysat for me all those times that I went out and, and partied. Um, and through all of those parties and friendships, I was still continuing to look for those friends' approval. I still wanted to fit in. Um, and uh, that continued on for me, that, that pattern of, of just the relationships um, ruling my life, so to speak. Um, I partied, I had no friends, um, and I barely ever thought of God or church or my church family. Um, I met another guy through these friends and we started dating. Um, he enjoyed partying, uh, we had fun, I followed suit with him just to make sure that I continued to fit in. I was well liked by him and all of our friends. Um, that was probably one of the hardest years of my life and the furthest away from God I could possibly go. Um, it was this, it was almost like a rock bottom um, situation for me. And um, there, uh, I knew there was a turning point in my life that needed to happen and um, I really relied on my parents a lot at that time. Um, they, they knew that I was a stubborn teenager and that they couldn't, you know, drive me back to church with them, but they did everything they could um, to push me in that direction. Um, I started spending a little bit more time with them, with uh, my daughter, um, and because I was spending more time um, away from that boyfriend, away from my um, partying, um, we decided to move on um, to somebody else, and shortly after we broke up, my Right, get ready for this because I'll test you at the end. <laughs> my ex mother in laws, or my ex mother in law, set me up with her niece's husband's stepbrother. <laughs> 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 so, my 
uh, ex-husband's mother took no time to say, my granddaughter needs somebody better in her mom's life, in her mom's life, and I don't even know how long, I don't think I was two minutes away from a breakup with this guy, and I, hey, Rachel, you want to come over to my house? I got somebody I want you to meet. So anyway, um, God was at work. Um, this whole time, God was at work. He had, a, he had this grand plan. Um, anyway, uh, he wasn't a partier. In fact, he attended church, and he liked spending time with me and my daughter. Um, I introduced him to my parents, and for the first time ever, they liked a guy I was dating. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember, I, they changed their mind since, don't I? I, really that that. <laughs> I can't I remember that the moment or the day I decided to start going back to church, but I did. My parents and my second family welcomed me back with open arms, and it was like I never left. After six months of dating this guy and six months of an engagement, I married him. The next year we had a son, and he adopted my daughter, and there hasn't been a moment in our lives where she wasn't as much his as our son was his. We attended church every Sunday. We bought a home together, a dependable vehicle. We both had jobs um, that we enjoyed, and we were able to support our family. I was feeling closer to God again. Um, I enjoyed spending time at church with my family. As a matter of fact, my parents were, and still are, some of my best friends. Through everything I've gone through, my parents continued to be there for me when I needed them, and they never stopped praying for me unconditionally. Um, never seen a love like it, but um, it's obvious that through my life, my friends and people I hung around were my influencers. I let myself be influenced, and in a sense, my relationships ruled my life. So much so that I believe God used my relationship with Gordy uh, to bring me back to him. My life is still far from perfect. Um, there are struggles and life still is hard. The difference now is that I focus on my relationship with God. I don't need to act a certain way or feel like I'm not accepted. He has taken care of me and provided for me. I didn't know it at the time, but he was with me during my darkest times. He gave me the parents I needed growing up to give me love and a strong Christian foundation. He gave me a church and a church family to love me. He gave me a Christian husband to love me and have a family with, and he even gave me the best friends I could ask for. He had a plan for me my whole life, and as I tried to make my own path, or as hard as I tried to make my own path, I think he guided me and is still guiding me back to where he wants me. Um, my husband and I, as well as our best friends, are the youth leaders at our church. Um, most of you know I'm the church clerk and the treasurer as well. Um, which I absolutely love. I love spending my time focusing on things that help me feel close to God. Um, there's not a lot of spiritual gifts that I say I possess, um, such as public speaking or um, that type of thing, but my, um, on the sideline, the administrative stuff, I absolutely love doing. Um, and so when I, was, when I was preparing this test, when I was trying to think of a specific verse um, that I could end with, and the one thing that kept coming to mind is, is not a verse. It's actually my favorite poem. It's on the cover of my Bible. Um, it's, it's just um, something that I really live by um, if I had to think of something outside of the Bible. So um, I'm just going to read that and then I'll be done. Uh, so Footprints in the Sand. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord across the dark sky flashed scenes for my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand, and I noticed that many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, but when I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. So when, when my grandmother just um, recently passed away in May, um, there, was, there was a family gathering where we went to her house after. And um, it's, it, it's an awful thing to think about, but or even to do, but... 
we all as a family got together and, and divided out their thing, her things to everybody just so it was fair. And if there was something that there was that special to somebody that they had the opportunity to, to say, you know, I really like this. And there was a plaque that had the footprints um, poem on it. And so I, I was the one that everyone was like, Rachel just needs this, Rachel needs this. So um, I have that up and, and that's just been one of my things that, um, you know, I've not always lived that Christian lifestyle. Um, but God, God always had this plan for me, and and I'm right, I, I'm right where I need to be, and, and you know, obviously God's still working on me, but um, you know, that's that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. I mean, it, listen, I'm a pastor, and from time to time, I have the privilege of trying to get people to do things, okay? And I called Rachel, you know, cold call. She had no idea what was coming. Hey, Rachel, um, can you give your testimony at family camp Labor Day weekend? Yep. <laughs> you know? I wasn't even like, I don't know. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't groggy. No. I just, and I was she like, sounded stone cold I got off the phone and I said, Gordy, you'll never guess what I just agreed to. <laughs> but, you know, that was one of those things that, you know, every one of those calls that I made, you know, and I've done this before, and it's like, you know, oh, come on, yeah. And that's why I asked you. Because I knew that you would stand up and talk about what God has done in your life. And you could be a living breathing example for the people around us, people who know you, um, of what a prodigal loving God is about. Because we're all prodigals. In one way or another, we're all prodigals. And that love of God that is, that is constantly there and is willing to open his arms and embrace us when we come crawling back. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to, I, other people, I, uh, Gordy, how come the cursor disappeared <laughs> and I can never find it? Not Gordy. I don't know. <laughs> there, was, there was a slide and it, it went through there at some point. And, um, but it had your testimony, Rachel Bollier. And the background slide, does anybody remember what the background slide was for the other ones? They were all the same. It doesn't matter. It, what was it? It doesn't matter. No, no. It was footprints in the sand. Oh, no it way. It was the oh, sand oh, yeah. beach, oh, and goodness. you could see the faint footprints. And that was intentional for me because everybody is telling the story about God working their lives. And God was hearing them. And Providing them, protecting them, leading them, guiding them. Okay. I hope. Well, I hope you were blessed tonight by Rachel's testimony. I was. Um, and if you've been here throughout the course of the weekend, I hope you were blessed by everyone else's testimony and encouraged by the fact that there's a real God who works in real people's lives through the real circumstances that we all go through. Some of those circumstances are happy, fun, some not so much. But God is in it all, calling his children to himself, showing them his love. <clears throat> I, wanted, I wanted real live people that you all know uh, to be sharing, sharing their testimony to give glory to God, as you did tonight, Rachel. Thank you for that, and thank you for your service at Mapleton. I thank Ruth, I thank you. Um, she's a great treasurer, a uh, great clerk, uh, has a great attitude, um, you know, it's particularly as a treasurer. I've served some treasurers who, uh, they're good at adding and subtracting and writing checks, but they don't have a good attitude about it. I've served with treasurers who have an attitude that I have to, I have to protect all this money. Um, Rachel has an attitude that it's the Lord's money. If the church has agreed that we're going to spend this money on these things, here we go. Uh, and so she does, does the work with the right attitude. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess what, what we'll do now is um, I will not give you the whole load. Uh, but tonight, I was going to finish off. Uh, throughout the course of the weekend, we have been 
Um, looking at the Word of God. Uh, we started on Friday night with Psalm 119, 105, uh, and we uh, talked about how God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, and tried to um, show some different ways that wherever you are in life, even if you're an unbeliever, God's Word can guide you of all the Scripture. Um, la uh, Saturday morning, uh, we spent some time out in the sun, uh, out there around the flagpole, and looked at John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth, Jesus said, your word is truth. And we talked about the reality that God's word is true, and how when something is true, it's true. And we have to line up with that truth, uh, whatever that is. In the case of the Bible, it means shaping our thinking and living to, um, to what God says. Um, last night we looked at uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures God breathed is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, talking about the inspiration of scripture. Uh, that this book, though it is written by some 40 different authors, has one author behind it all, and that's God. Uh, and because it comes from God, it is authoritative, and it is a word that uh, we need to uh, pay attention to. Um, so, uh, that's kind of a summary of the weekend, and I felt obligated, um, really constrained, you know, that I couldn't really go anywhere else tonight than this passage, uh, James chapter 1, uh, verses 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. I felt I had to go to, to that passage because throughout the course of the weekend so much of my thrust has been on Read the Bible. Trust the Bible. Get it into your life. Okay? But the Bible is not about stuffing our head full of knowledge. It's about getting that information in. We take the Bible in, and then we're supposed to live it out. Okay? If we only read the Bible, but we don't put it into practice, it doesn't, the rubber doesn't meet the road when we go outside those doors. We're missing the purpose of what God has for us. He wants us to put into practice the things that we read and learn from this, this book. Okay? Um, so we want to be like those people who hear and do. Uh, we don't want to be like the person who looks in the mirror and they see the major bed head and, you know, go off to get a comb and forget why they're going off and they don't do anything about it. Okay? Um, that's not a good thing, uh, according to the scripture. And Matthew chapter 7, I think. See, this is dangerous. I laid down my notes. So we can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matthew chapter 7. Um, it's, it's dangerous to expose ourselves to God's word and not do with it what God wants it to be done. Um, Jesus uh, said this, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 26, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, and the person who hears but doesn't do, the person who looks intently into the law of freedom but goes away and forgets what he read, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I've encouraged and exhorted folks through the weekend to um, be reading God's word, be trusting God's word, believing God's word, but we've got to live God's word. Otherwise, we're building on sand. We're fools. There's a danger in that, James says. Do not merely read the word, 
not merely, I want to get the words right. Do not merely listen to the word and so, what's the word? What's the next word? You see. see yourself. It is the, there's a danger there. The danger if I just read God's word. You know, it's like the, uh, the people you, you can, if I were using my slides, there would be a picture there, but you go to a certain, some workplaces and you'll see a sign that we've had X number of day, safe days, no, no work, no lost time incidents, whatever, those kind of <coughs> things. And, and that's good, but some people do that with their spiritual life too, that uh, I've had X number of consecutive days where I've read the Bible. Nothing wrong with that, as long as they're putting into practice what they read. Because I've encountered some Christians that they're happy to let you know how many consecutive days they've read the Bible. And if you let slip that your number is smaller than theirs, oh, tsk, 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 tsk. Okay? But, they're making the mistake of thinking that God is a has impressed with the number of consecutive days of reading his word that they are. That God is as impressed with that as they are. God is more impressed that maybe you've read the Bible fewer days consecutively, but you've put more into practice. That's what God wants. He wants our lives to be changed and transformed by his word. Because that's where the blessing is. Um, in, in James, do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. See, there, there's blessing in living in obedience to God's word. This, this blessing is living under the smile of God's faith. Living under the, the contentment that comes from knowing that as I live in obedience to God's word, I'm living in sync with what God intended me to live as to begin with. And when you do that, uh, my image from Sunday morning sermon here at Maple and Aunt Bethany, we stop trying to put the square peg in a round hole in life. And all of a sudden things are, oh, okay. There is that blessing that comes into our lives when we live in obedience to God's word, when we take it in and live it out. There is a blessing that attaches to that. There is joy, there's peace, there's satisfaction, uh, there's hope. All of those wonderful words and concepts that come from the scriptures become ours. <coughs> because we're living the way God intended us to live. And as Jesus said, back in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 24 this time, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. When we have our foundation of our lives on this rock, what we're hearing and doing, life can be chaos all around us. The winds can beat and blow. But we stand firm. Because we're living the way God <coughs> commanded us to live. That, all, that doesn't necessarily happen. There's not like a one-to-one -one kind of connection necessarily that, hey, I read the Bible this morning and immediately I experience some kind of blessing. Okay, Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, <coughs> the Bible. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. Whatever he does possible. When we read God's word, it's like we're, we're sowing a, a seed in our lives. <coughs> that maybe right now we don't see the impact of that truth that we're taking into our lives. But over time, 
as we continue to hear and do God's word, there's a sweet, rich, full harvest that comes into our lives because we are living in obedience to God. We're living in the righteousness that he wants us to live in. The righteousness which allows him to pour out his richest blessing uh, on us. Um, in a practical kind of way, you think about, think about a teenager who hears all this stuff about sex, sounds like a pretty good deal, when, sooner the better kind of attitude, but they say, no, the Bible says, wait. And so they do. They might get mocked by their peers. They might get pressured by friends. Um, the media all around them is going to say, you are, you are square to the definition of square. But you know that they're going to re reap a sweet and rich harvest when they are married to the person that God intended for them to be with, and they have that one flesh relationship that God intended for them to have and enjoy, and there's no baggage. They reap the harvest in season. It took a while to get there, but because God's word, they, they took God's word into their lives, and they made decision by decision by decision by decision to get there, um, they're going to reap a sweet harvest. Speaking of decisions, uh, we're going to have to make decisions in order to incorporate God's word uh, into our lives. Stop that! <laughs> Gordy's coming to rescue. Yes, come rescue me, Gordy. Where is the stinking cursor? <laughs> Here it is, sir. Here it is. See? <laughs> See? It's the magic touch. That's why you put him in the sound booth at Basilton and don't let him out. you got to stay there. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I, because I... There's a quote that I, I need to show you. Um, One of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day, that is the judgment, that prayerlessness was not from a lack of time. John Piper. Now I know Piper well enough to know that I can adapt that. Uh, probably he's preaching on prayer or something in that context. I don't know. All I've got is that quote. I don't know where it comes from. But he would say the same thing about reading and studying the Bible. We're going to need to make decisions about how we use the 24 hours we get every day so that we're taking God's word in. And then we're going to need to make decisions so that we live it out. But when you do that, you will be blessed. I was about to say, I promise you. But God promises you. Take his word in. Live it out. He will bless you. Questions or comments or thoughts? Does anybody want to have any input? We're kind of formal. This is more like a grandiose Bible study, but anybody want to say anything? You want to throw anything? <laughs> <laughs> Read a quote of Spurgeon that I like, and it fits in line with that. He said, Be living Bibles. Be living Bibles. Mm -hmm. And I like that a lot. Yep. We, we want to, good thought, we, we want to live in accordance with the Bible, but we want to do it in a way that's true to the word, but not needlessly offensive to the people around us, okay? In other words, we don't have to go around, you know, all puffed out that I'm living out the truth of God's word. Just do it humbly, just do it sincerely, do it faithfully. Do it without calling a bunch of attention to yourself that, hey, I'm living according to the Bible. They'll know. They'll get it. It's when we start to puff it up, puff ourselves up and make it about us that we kind of short circuit that. Over. When you, like when you read the Bible and you follow the Bible, the Word of God, 
you live the clean Christian life, right? The clean life. Yeah. It's the clean yeah. life. Yeah. 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 Purity. Yeah. Purity. Okay. Yeah. Nope. Anything else you want to say? Questions you want to ask? All right. Um, one one more thing, uh, then we'll close with prayer. But um, I was going to say this uh, earlier, uh, had we had more people, but uh, I will say it now. Uh, Change my mind. There's not enough people here. I will say it. Um, even though you may not have been here for family camp, if you have suggestions about family camp, what would make family camp attractive to you? If you have been here this weekend and you want to make suggestions about what could make family camp better, um, see Scott or you know get online. You know, write an email to thebaptistpark at gmail.com. Okay, like the one and only Baptist Park, thebaptistpark at gmail.com. Just send an email. Okay, um, I know the organizers are encouraged by what transpired this weekend. Um, it's a good, it's Scott, it's 2003 was the last time we had family camp here, 16 years ago. So the fact that we have 30 people here? Almost 40. Oh, 40? Yeah, I, I was just seeing the, I was just seeing the evening. 46. How many? There was 46. That 46. On Friday's registration. Yeah. Uh, wow. That's great. That's great. Okay, but how many do the Pentecostals have out here? 350. 350. <laughs> About 10 times what we have, okay? We'll get there. We'll get there. I'm an optimist and God is, God is on the throne, but we need your help. You know, if you've got ideas about what would be good, what would be attractive, we would like to fill this place um, for the fact that this is a wonderful facility. A wonderful place to meet with God, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we'd like to see that. There's no reason it couldn't be, uh, but we we need input from others so that we can make it the best for the most. So, see Scott if you got ideas about that, or uh, a simple email to thebaptistpark at gmail.com and you know, family camp ideas in the subject line, something like that. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we come with uh, grateful hearts for uh, your, uh, your love toward us. Uh, thank you for this place that has been such a, a beacon of the, the Word of God and the Gospel for over eight decades now, uh, approaching uh, nine decades, 90 years almost. Uh, we, we rejoice in that rich history. We are thankful to be uh, in the stream of that, and uh, we are thankful for uh, things that you have done this weekend. You will all know uh, the, the depth and breadth of that. Uh, we praise you for it. Uh, we pray that you would continue your work in those who have been here this weekend uh, so that uh, their relationship with you would grow uh, deeper, stronger, uh, fuller. Uh, their light for you would shine brighter. Uh, do that in each person's heart, whether that means someone coming to know you, uh, maybe as a result of seeds that were sown here, uh, for those who have come already knowing you, may we grow uh, ever more in you. Uh, thank you for using Baptist Park this summer. Uh, continue to bless and provide uh, for Baptist Park and the financial needs that um, uh, remain uh, as the final, final bills are coming due here in the next 30 or 60 days. Um, provide. And uh, we give you the glory uh, for what you did this weekend, uh, what you've done through the summer. Uh, thank you for each one who has come tonight and uh, bless them. Uh, bless them for um, your love for them. Uh, bless them for their love for you. Uh, may, uh, may they know uh, the richness of your love in increasing measures. In Jesus' name.